Uh, do you want to just stretch a bit and uh, like you have one minute of talking, we'll allow our first speaker of the panel discussions to get ready. So we've got three talks, three 20 minutes. I'll probably be a bit more strict about the length of questions so that we break for lunch at 12. Right, so you have a bit of leg stretching. So our first speaker, we're going to have a whole series of three talks on artificial intelligence and climate change. So finish your stretching. All right, and we're going to... Now we're going to get started on our first talk. So our first speaker, we have Andrew Gelman, who's come from Columbia University. And Andrew is going to speak to us about, I'm going to say maths, statistics, and politics. Here you go. And so can we welcome Andrew? Can we stop the screen? Turn off the screen? Or mute the screen. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, we we have a, a growing problem in the world with of. Um, does this work? Yes. Yeah. We've we've a growing problem of political extremism and instability, uh, as you're aware. Uh, politics lurches between the left, right, and center, and we have major political parties that question democracy itself um, and ally with foreign dictatorships. And it's reminiscent of the 1930s, um, and it, it gets people, including me and, and others, very scared. Um, what will happen in response to economic disasters such as depression or climate change? How is mathematics relevant to this? So, so I'll, I'll give some examples of, of mathematical problems um, that have some connection. And then I'll conclude with a, a kind of scary story that makes me look like the bad guy, um, the inadvertent uh, bad guy, and suggest what that implies for mathematical communication. Um, so just as background, I was a... I, I studied mathematics in high school and was in the Mathematics Olympiad program where I, I learned that there were people who were better at math than, than I was. And back then, the mathematics education, the, the impression we had was that there's theoretical mathematics and that's it. And at any time, there are some people like Cauchy who proved the theorems. And I just wasn't sure what the other mathematicians were, were actually doing. They didn't tell us about applied math. So I, I, studied, I studied physics in, in college uh, as that seemed more useful. Um, I ended up becoming a statistician because I didn't understand physics. I was only able to do well in the classes because I could solve all the math problems. But yet, I didn't want to be that person who did the thing that became obsolete once Cauchy came around. And so I, I was very happy to become a statistician. Uh, I think had I known about applied math, there were many things I could have done. And much of my work is on, on political science. Um, <laughs> so I, I do have this kind of thinking like a mathem mathematician um, view, but I, I see some limitations in how mathematics is connected to the rest of the world. Uh, let's consider a problem of, uh, well, politics could be considered mathematically as the problem of aggregation of preferences. Uh, it, it's more difficult than you might think because your preferences do not exist until the question is asked. So in, in a matter reminiscent of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, uh, there are certain view, certain issues you have very strong beliefs on, as, as we just heard in the questions a few minutes ago. Uh, but then there are other issues that you don't think about until somebody asks you, and your preferences might depend on the order with which the questions are asked. But let's set that aside for a moment and imagine that Einstein was right, and the world can be described in terms of latent variables. And so imagine that you actually do, that every person has a latent preference on every issue, just as the old-fashioned economists seem to think that we have little utility functions in our heads the same way. Um, 
in that case, mathematics is the problem of aggregation of preferences. And let's consider a simple preference aggregation problem with nine voters. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And they're going to vote to decide on some important issue like where to go to lunch today. Um, <laughs> And uh, for simplicity, knowing nothing, we're going to assume that all two to the ninth, po there are two outcome, two possibilities. So there are two to the ninth possible sets of attitudes. Um, what is the, if you are this one person, what's the probability that your vote is decisive in this little election? Well, it will be decisive if the other voters are split four to four. Um, and so this will give you a probability of decisiveness of this. I, I like to do little simple math that we can all relate to. This is your probability of decisive vote. Um, well, 0.273 isn't bad, but you might want a little bit more voting power than that, right? Because the more voting power you have, the more you can cash it in for other, other good things. Um, so uh, instead, uh, what we're going to do is five of the voters are going to get together and they are going to have a little vote of their own to decide where to go to lunch. And they pre-committed that whoever wins this election, they're going to vote as a block of five. Um, well, that's pretty good. Uh, these people have zero voting power at all. Um, and then um, your power, your voting power, if you're one of five, is now this, because you just need to have the other voters split two to two. That's not bad, is it? And in fact, the probability goes up to 0.375. Uh, these people have a probability of decisiveness of zero, but that's not their problem that they were a little slow. Right? So it makes us realize how much, of, how much of games are based on conventions. So even a very simple game, like you play a game of Monopoly with two other people, or whatever the equivalent game they play here in, in Europe is. And your chance of winning the game is one third, but you could decide at the very beginning that you're going to have a coalition, flip a coin, and have a coalition with one other player, and you're going to share all your assets and collude. Then your chance of winning jumps up to one half. Well, it's essentially one half. The other per third person would have to be incredibly lucky to win, uh, but that's unstable because it just depends on who decided first. Okay. But there's more instability than that, actually. This is pretty good, but you could do better. Um, <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, three, four, five, six. Okay, now you decide to be in a group of three, and that is going to be your, your chance of... Uh, they, you're going to, again, vote on who goes to lunch. Well, it turns out if you're in a group of three, your probability of decisive, well, it's a half because the other two people just have to be split, right, which is 50-50. But then also, the other six can't be, if like if you win this, this is three, so then you just need two of the others to have a win. So the other six can't, um, can't be split four to two or more against you. And it turns out the probability of that is, is 50 64th. And, and so you get 0.391. I computed these ahead of time just for you. Um, actually, just 20 years ago when I published the paper on this. Um, OK, and everybody else is, has a probability which is, is 0.15. Six, it turns out. So actually, you're better off being a little bit like, yeah, like a little risky here. Like this gives you for sure, but you, you know, it's the product of the two numbers that's important, right? So, um, so this is pretty good. So here we are. Well, what's the next step? Well, these people are left out, but these people aren't, right? They can do something too. So this gets to the next one, which is this. So yeah, you got this probably you got this, but they're they're not they're not just sitting there, right? They form coalitions. And now everybody's probability is 
actually just 0.25 because it's 50% times the probability the other two coalitions are 50% split. So, okay, so now let's look at this. So that's why I said it's kind of fun, interesting, because it's not just like the Monopoly game where, like a game of slapjack where whoever like plays it first wins. Um, we, there's a very natural, st we, we start with this, which is the rules, right? We're gonna have an election. Then five people get together and do this. And then out of the five, what do we have? These five are all happy dominating the whole lunch conversation. And then three of the five make a subgroup, right? So we go from here to this. These four are left out, but look, these you get. Okay, so now these two people are left out also, right? These people, actually, this is great because your probability is, is, is actually 0.5 of deciding. You can't do better than, than 0.5 in, in this game. But then these two people have no power. So, of course, like, they, they kind of, once they realize that they have no power in their coalition, they just walk up to here, and that gets you to this. Well, this so 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 that's still pretty good for these people. They're they're left out. Um, oh, sorry. That right goes from here to here to here. Right now to here. Then when you're here, you go to here, and this is stable, right? Because there's nothing more you can do except look. Everyone's probability is 0.25. Here it was 0.273. So everybody's worse off, which seems to violate some principle. Well, I'll get to that in a second. But at this point, they can all say, "Hey, look, we're all in the same boat. Let's dissolve all these coalitions and go back to here." So there's no stability, right? Well, this is like. Political instability, it's, it's a kind of silly example, but it's interesting that it can apply mathematically. We should have some intuition, how, how can this be worse? Like this is completely symmetric and yet everybody's worse off than here. We can keep doing this. So if I have a large number of voters, we can consider, so instead of nine voters, we have a whole bunch, we have N voters. N is supposed to be a big number, actually here. N, okay. So <laughs> let's consider some voting power. But first, I, well, let's hold off the intuition until, until the end here. Um, and so, okay, you're, if, if, if just a simple system like this, um, the, you're voting the probability that one person is decisive turns out to be 0.8 times n to the minus 1 half. Well, it goes like 1 over square root of n, which kind of makes sense if, if people are flipping coins. Um, well, just to say, real life elections aren't like this. Because a real life election, this, the probability of decisive vote is, is much lower because actually people aren't flipping coins to decide how to vote. Um, but it's just math, right? Um, now, we can consider an optimal coalition size. So one group of voters decides they're going to get together. Now, if this is n over 2 plus 1, they dominate. But remember, we don't need n over 2 plus 1. We still get the benefit. So it turns out that the optimal coalition size is, uh, I did this too, it's 1.4 times the square root of n voters. So it's pretty, it's pretty small. If you form the optimal coalition size, then your voting power is like 0.57 times n to the minus 1 fourth. So it's actually much higher. Um, but then the other thing would be where, where this procedure ends up and is like this, but coalitions of size three all the way down. And if you do that, then everyone's voting power becomes n to the minus 0.63, which is the log of three or the log base two of three or, or something like that. Um, so again, well, this is worse. Minus 0.63 is worse than minus a half. So you, you get this, the deeper the coalitions, the, the more you can get. So what's the intuition here? Why, how is it? that this can be symmetric and yet worse for everybody than this. Very simple intuition is imagine an election where there's 
a dictator, a king, and the king is chosen at random. So it's completely fair, right? We're going we're gonna to spin a big spinner, and one of us is going to be the king, and he or she um, is going to decide where we go to lunch. Then what's your voting power? It's 1 over n because you have a one over n chance of being the king. So it turns out it's actually better to have a democracy, because then your chance of being decisive is um, goes like n to the minus 1 half, than it is to have a king, even if the king is chosen in a completely fair way. And, and because then it's one over n. And, and this is sort of in between, having, having a king like that. There is a mathematical theorem that, that I, I proved that in the situation of completely random voting, this optimizes the average voting power. Uh, unfortunately, somebody proved that theorem a couple of years before I did and, and published it. So I don't get credit for that one. Um, but it's kind of kind of interesting. Um, now I had more examples which I do not have time for, um, unfortunately. Um, so let me jump to my story. Well, I'll s briefly. I, um, there's there are related issues with what is called the median voter theorem, which is that if there's a distribution of voters in one dimension, then it's optimal to have a candidate who's in the middle of the voter, in the middle, and that candidate will dominate all elections. If you have a higher dimensional distribution, you can, again, that, that this instability. In higher dimensions, there, being in the, there is no median in higher dimensions, and it turns out that being in the middle of the distribution will not necessarily win elections, and, and there is no stable point. Um, now, the thing that I'm concerned about a little and I have more that I, I won't also talk about, measuring political extremism. But the thing that I'm concerned about is this is kind of really fun. And also, as a mathematician, it makes me feel very relevant because I have a social conscience like we all do. So I feel like, look, this is fun, and it's about politics, and that's important, and I'm a good person by, by doing that. Um, so my story is a few years ago, 30 five years ago, I was involved in a project on um, measuring um, political imbalances of the sort where sometimes you'll have a state or a country where one party will have 45% of the vote but receive 60% of the seats in the legislature. So we, we have situations like that in like in, in Britain is, is very famous because they have this multi-party system. And, and in the United States, there are some states where this happens. Um, this is sometimes attributed to how the district lines are drawn, uh, which in the United States they call gerrymandering. Um, we did a project. Well, it's easy to say that and give examples like this, like with pictures. but. Re you can also look at real data and, and look, and I, and I won't get into this here because I have zero time, but if you, you can look at the fairness of actual legislatures, state legislatures in the United States, and look at who, draw the district, who drew the district lines. We found in a, um, in a, that it wasn't that important who drew the district lines and that redrawing the district lines typically made the elections more competitive and more fair. So we wrote a paper, and we published it in 1994, called Enhancing Democracy Through Legislative Redistricting. And we said redistricting was great, and we published this. It was very, like, we were very, felt very clever, right? Like, we proved this stuff. We figured this stuff out. It was counterintuitive. We loved that, right? The intuition was that drawing the line, districts made things worse. But actually, it didn't. Things changed since 1994. Now, right now in the United States, there are a lot of problems because of how the district lines are drawn. And part of it is we have a more polarized climate in the United States now. And back in the 1980s, you couldn't do an extremely unfair districting because the courts would throw it out. But now the courts are, are very partisan, and, and they don't throw things out. So I feel a little bad, because I feel there was always this thing where people talked about redistricting being a problem, and we laughed at them. We said, oh, you're just not sophisticated like we are. If you look at it carefully, it's not redistricting is good. We were right 
to describe the 1970s and 1980s that way, but we, things have changed that way. So I think there is a, there is a warning that this fun mathematics is fun, and I do think it's relevant to politics in, in many ways. But we have to be careful not to go in there and, and act like we know what we're doing um, when we don't. That, that's all. Thanks, Andrew. OK, so we started a little bit late, so we've got time for one question. Um, I, I think we can only really go for one question. Um, and then maybe if we get our questions done quickly, we can ask Andrew one more question at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if you are aware of work of Moon Dungeon and all that she was doing uh, with relation to redistricting. And as far as I know, there was a state in which there was a law uh, and process which was wind with the help of uh, mathematics because uh, there was a distincting plan and then there was a distincting plan proposed by some random work on distincting plans and uh, it uh, seemed to be more fair. Uh, in the sense uh, that uh, their random work defines. Uh, so I was interested in that because I feel that there is already some some change done with mathematics. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think that mathematics can be very valuable in two ways. Um, one is to measure things, and the other is to make ideas more precise. And so the random walk on redistricting plans is, is not perfect, but it's a, it's, it has the advantage of being clearly defined. And I think that's very important to say this, this it's going to be, I think it's, that's, that's super valuable. I think a lot of it just is that we, that the mathematics will not necessarily give us the answer or solve the problem, but it can refine people's thinking by being precise. Right, well, thank you so much, Andrew. I personally think that you did the right thing, and it's just a case that you need to do the right thing again. <laughs> so you're, no problems there. We can always revisit things. So we're going to move on to Daniel now. So if we can all just thank Andrew again. OK, now we have Daniel Ramos from Imaginary. And he's going to talk to us about the mathematics of the climate crisis. I think most of you know Daniel. Imagine we've been organizing this for a while. Can you now welcome Daniel? Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, to the organizers, which kind of includes me because I'm part of Imaginary. Uh, so, um, yeah, one of the good things is that if you are part of the organizing team, most people know about what is, what uh, is uh, doing, so I think most of you know what we do at Imaginary. We organize uh, math exhibitions, uh, mainly. And uh, I'm here just to, to present uh, one of our latest projects that we have been working for a year and a half, some, some more or less now. And it's the 10-minute museum uh, on the climate crisis mathematics. So uh, what is a 10-minute museum? It's uh, oh yeah yeah. So the technology is not helping. But actually, I have some control. So strange. Uh. Yeah, but now I cannot switch the... Uh, now, okay, so hopefully now it works. Yes. So this is uh, our idea of what is a 10-minute museum. So it's uh, this artifact here, you can, you can see it's... Uh, about uh, one square meter of footprint, about two meters tall. It has uh, four sides, it's a prism more or less, and you can walk around 
And the idea is that uh, you can install it in, well, it can be a mini museum inside of a museum, or it can also be installed in a public space, like uh, a library, the hall of your faculty, um, um, waiting room of, uh, of hospital, or train station, anything you can imagine. And it is that if you have 10, spare, uh, 10 minutes to, to spare around, you can walk around and learn something. And uh, yeah, so this is what we thought it could be a good format for, for making uh, uh, this exhibition. And the topic is climate crisis. I promise this is the only stock photo that I put. Uh, this is, uh, well, I, I think we don't, I don't have to justify why it is important to, to, to talk about the climate crisis. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the, the most important thing that uh, you can do, the first thing you, you have to do to fight climate crisis is understand it. So we wanted to communicate the science behind the climate crisis. And then you take your own conclusions, so you decide if you can do something or what is the best uh, course of action. But here is, is mostly about teaching the science behind. And what is the science of climate? Well, the, the, the science of climate, it's a compound science because you have physics, you have uh, biology, you have uh, a meteorology, you have all, all the science combines and what links all the science? Of course, mathematics. So that's, that's what we are trying to, to, to put here. So it's a museum about modelization in mathematics. So I am going to play this video and we are going to have a, a, a tour about this 10 minutes uh, museum. So if you go to the, uh, like the, the entrance of the museum, there are numbers to say this is the first, second, this is the welcome uh, screen. And then here you say, uh, here you find what is a model so here you have a visualization on, of a global circulation model. Uh, this is, this is visualized something of what uh, a researcher could uh, have as an output of one of the most complex uh, methods, uh, uh, models, uh, which is, uses uh, fluid mechanics. And then it uses the Navier-Stokes equation. And we have this uh, beautiful applet where you can drag your, yeah, drag, uh, drag your fingers around, mixing this, uh, uh, this uh, virtual fluid. So you go to the next section, which is uh, about the philosophy of uh, models, of what, of what can you learn from models. You learn something about the golf stream that we'll have the time for to, to talk a little bit then. Uh, there is a box model exhibition, which essentially it will, I promise, it will tell you what is a differential equation, even if you don't realize about it. And you can play and you can change the parameters and you can see how this hypothetical plan that you can control with this key, with this knob, how it behaves and what can we do and what is impossible and what are the mathematical properties, like the inertia that you cannot change things if it is too late or that, uh, yeah, the, 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 this, uh, the memory that has the system. Uh, we have also some um, kind of artistical interpretations in form of music of uh, how can you, uh, see or uh, can you, can, how can you hear the, the the warming of the planet? There are a couple of peep, uh, holes, peep holes uh, that uh, you can look inside, and there are some uh, Easter eggs uh, inside that you can see. This is a warming navigator where you can select the the country and the year, and you see the the deviation above the the, the average. Uh, this side is is about the uh, data. Um, this is uh, some grid models of how to uh, geometrically split the, the Earth to, to making these models like the, the one we, we saw before. So uh, there are some basic models about latitude longitude, but you can split the, the, the Earth in different cells with different geometries. So mathematics is also helping on, on this, even more abstract mathematics. There are some uh, seashells here because we are going to the fourth uh, uh, section, which is about consequences of climate change. So you see if, uh, if there is uh, this global warming with the, with the excess of CO2 acidifies the, the ocean. Uh, this is a metaphor, let's say, for the nonlinear behavior of these complex systems so that at some point you are almost stable and suddenly you have to fall. So this is kind of a metaphorical visualization of uh, tipping points that you find in, in dynamical systems. Um, uh, 
and here, yes, we have here the human component. So we recorded some interviews with some climate scientists across all the spectrum of the careers. So from uh, directors and uh, and the important people, saying very established, to 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 researchers and PhD students that are on the, all the, the stage of their careers. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think it was three minutes, and we also. So more or less the the museum. Okay, so I think I uh, I will try to to go into where is it? Yeah, um, I will show you in in a bit of, a bit a little bit more detail uh, three of the, the the components of this uh, uh, of this museum. Uh, first is that we have these uh, general circulation models or global circulation models, depend who you ask. What is the acronym for? Uh, so, for instance, we explain this Gulf Stream uh, behavior. You can see it here. This is the, the, the actual exhibit we have there. So, uh, this is not running the model in real time. Of course, this is just a visualization of some results. But here you can, you can see the, the currents of, uh, of wind, or the, the wind and the, the, the water currents uh, in the oceans. And here you can see, for instance, there is this, this current. This is called the Gulf Stream because it's it's uh, hot water coming from the Gulf of Mexico, is going up to the Atlantic, and it's reaching the northern parts of Europe. And actually, uh, um, the, the British Islands, uh, France, also Denmark, Germany, even the northern uh, uh, countries there have a much warmer climate than they should because of the, the latitude. So if you compare with Canada, for instance, and they, they are they are warmer because of this current, but this current depends on, on the, the temperature, but also on the salinity. If there is global warming, the, the poles are uh, releasing a lot of ice in the form of water, and this is uh, sweet water, not salty water, so the, the currents change. So actually, if there is global warming, in Europe we could have much colder climate. So this is one of the unexpected things that you don't see. They say, oh, this global warming, we will have warmer seasons and actually there are some these this, uh, chain effects that you can you could have the opposite effect. Uh, another uh, yeah the uh, exhibit that you saw is the Navier Stokes equation. Somebody said yesterday, oh we are afraid of uh, equations. So these are nice equations. So <laughs> <laughs> and you see that this is well uh, the, the one we have in the in the physical one is in German. This is the, the English version but it's exactly that what we have uh, built. So there are annotated, explaining what is each of the components, or at least what are the symbols. So you, you get some, some ideas, and then you say at some point, yeah, yeah, this is like uh, Newton's laws, or this is actual reaction, or whatever, and this is conservation of, uh, of uh, mass, or whatever. So you, you have this, uh, uh, this annotation, and then you play with uh, this exhibit. Um, you will find the, all the references later. So this is very nice to play. It really runs smoothly, and it is it's very nice. And now I hear I only have one finger on this touchpad, but in 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 the real one you can have multi-touch, and it's it's really nice. Um, and yeah, and the the, the third one that I, I want to explain is that actually is the more demanding mathematically for the visitors. Probably the Navier stocks are more advanced mathematically. But this is the more demanding because we try to explain you how to run your own model. So uh, this is box models. You know that the box model is essentially you have any quantity. You can you can think about uh, money or people or in this case energy, and you put this in boxes and then you have an inflow and outflow. So essentially you have quantity in inflow and outflow. So you have like a differential equation: what is getting in, what is getting out. So in practice, what we, do we have is uh, this, uh, let me try to put here. Yeah. So this is the, the, the screen of the, um, uh, uh, of the display that we have for, for box models. So you can have, uh, you have these graphs. And then on this one is the energy balance of the planet. So the energy is coming from the sun. It is going out as a form of infrared radiation, but some part of it is directly reflected because of the albedo, it's the reflectance of the uh, of the of the planet, and uh, yeah, you can change it. 
So yeah, you see things like uh, conservation of energy. So the same amount that gets in goes out, but this doesn't mean that you have always the same temperature because the temperature depends on this part of, of this infrared radiation that you have. This is the first toy example. Then you go to the next example and say, okay, the, but the albedo it depends on the ice and the clouds, so it is linked to the to the to the temperature. So uh, the two are not independent. Uh, actually, you can go and there, there is a magic button that says the math button. Uh, you push the button and then you get the equations, and then you can press. You you have also different uh, text on on screen. Uh, so on this uh, second example, you push the the math button and you see, oh, there is this uh, this relationship between alpha and t. So this is uh, so so the, the model is different. And actually, here what you can see is the hysteresis uh, curve of the system. So this is a system that has some memory. So it does not depend just on the position where you are, but also where you come from. So it means that if you have this energy influx, you have this temperature, but it depends on what you had before. So if you go higher and then you, you get warmer, but if you want to get back to the same temperature, maybe you can't because you will come back for another uh, position here. So uh, let me try. Yeah, here you see that, uh, yeah, you can control the, the, the emissivity from the sun. So here you can uh, kind of a god that you can uh, find the, the, the strength of the, yeah, it's, it's fighting the, who can control the, the thing because, yeah, I can control here. Yeah, so you have, yeah, you come back here and it, it's, it's so cold, so cold, so cold. You want to, and if you want to come back to the same temperature, yeah, even if you have the same emissivity, you are not. You have to go higher. You have to go higher. So this is a system that has some memory. So you ha it has some force that you have to apply. And the third model is the realistic one, which we're, we explained here, the greenhouse effect. So this is this is the kind. This is uh, as much realistic as we as we could do it, uh, but something that you can still still play. So. Uh, here you can adjust the amount of CO2 on the atmosphere, and then you can see what uh, what happens on the system. Because now you have two boxes: you have the ground and the atmosphere, and they are they are fine to each other. Um, so uh, we could replace this uh, uh, with uh, this diagram, which is equivalent to the first model. This is the diagram equivalent to the second uh, uh, model. This is the one for the greenhouse effect. And we could also say you don't need this fancy programming. You can do it actually with just Excel. But then what we are doing is changing our 10 minute museum in our 90 minutes workshop, which is for another day. <laughs> so this is something else we also plan to, to, uh, to expand on this. Uh, so yeah, I will just leave you with this uh, website. This is the companion uh, website that uh, it's, a, it's this website. Uh, you have all the same text as, the, as the, in the physical one you have in, in the website in different languages. So if the physical one is in German, you don't speak German, you can go here and you can read it in English. Uh, we will do more uh, languages. Uh, we will do more replicas. We'll make the physical one also in different languages. And uh, yeah, and we, we are, uh, yeah, this is the coming soon uh, projects. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we can have one question for Daniel. I think we can just, yeah, just, just one. So go on, don't hold it in. Yeah, okay, I'm going to pass this across. Thanks, Daniel, for the presentation. Um, it's not a question, it's a comment. It's, there is a conference organized late November and beginning of December called Climatics by some friends of mine. I, I put the poster at the IHP, to which you are definitely invited. If I'm trying to put them in contact with you. <laughs> but um, so it's just to warn people over there that there are some people trying to come together with different sciences, doing workshops on how to 
present math of climate change to other other sciences so that they can incorporate it. And I think this is going in this direction in a brilliant way. So I, I hope these forces can join and they, they hope to create a regular workshop, an annual workshop and try to seep it through. At least in Switzerland, they're gonna try to incorporate exercises in, for example, calculus one. Just if you're, if the exercises you have to do already have to deal with climate change, it's just gonna seep through slowly, but hopefully in time. So yeah, thanks a lot for what you did. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm going to look forward for this. Um, I had a comment as well, Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a conference for science discovery centers and they had a psychology talk on, it was how much bad news you can give someone and it was to do with the climate crisis. So they said, if you give someone, you know, after about 10 minutes, you know, it's like, that, that's the bad news. So I wondered if for your extra activities, you could have activities around solutions as well so that the, the brain is kind of recharged and, and absorbing energy again. Yeah, we, um, we have uh, only one side that deals about the consequences of, and they talks a little bit, and then from this is, you could go further after seeing the consequences and say, what can you do? But then it's, uh, we thought it's, uh, it's very dangerous to be prescriptive. So you mm -hmm. say, oh, you should do this, or you should stop eating from meat, yeah. or you should, uh, um, I don't know, stop uh, using airplanes. Or uh, which maybe you should, but this is, uh, I think this is better uh, that you get to this conclusion by yourself and not because the, 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 the museum says so. Yeah. So we, we try to explicitly avoid telling people like magic solutions, like you should do this, 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 yeah. or proposing. Yeah. yeah, good idea. Okay, can we all thank Daniel then? So, for the next session, we have Volker Gabler and Bianca Violet, and they're here from Mathematic Informatics Station, or Station, and Imaginary. And they're going to talk about communicating artificial intelligence. So, can we welcome them? Okay, so we want to present an exhibition to you which is on artificial intelligence. It's called I Am AI, Explaining Artificial Intelligence. And in the first part of the talk, I will give you some impressions of the digital exhibits. I can show you in a live demo on screen. And Volker from Mainz is uh, showing you the physical exhibits because our exhibition is now in Heidelberg. Okay, so when the exhibition is for the general public, and most people think of AI as a black box, um, which mysteriously solves complex tasks. And we would like to open up this black box with our exhibition. And we focus on the core concepts, the main methods of AI. So we want to convey the core concepts of AI in a playful way. And the, so we have games in the exhibitions. We also have a graphic novel. And it just should just be fun for the people to explore and interact with our exhibits. And they still learn and understand, but in an intuitive way. So I, even I, if I know everything already from our exhibits, I still like to go there and play with the exhibits because it's just fun, even if I don't learn anything new. Oh, and one important thing, um, all our exhibits are open source. So they are on our website, which I will share later. Uh, and all, all the links, the direct links, I will share later with you. So anybody can use it, can reproduce it. That's our um, philosophy. So I'll show you one of the exhibits, which is called Neural Numbers. And I'll try to uh, show and then tell, as Nikki said, so I'll show you. That's what it looks like in the exhibit, exhibition on, on larger screen. <laughs> so and now I can tell, I guess. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a box for the input of a neural network for the user to input digits between zero and nine. And you, you could also input anything else, like scribbles or whatever, and 
try to trick the AI. And then on the right side, there's the output of the AI, which is also a digit. Uh, actually, uh, like in the middle, you see the confidence bar. If I write really clearly a seven, then the confidence of the seven is high. But the, the output is actually all the confidence bars. So the AI knows that it's, uh, it, it knows it could be a two or a three, so I'm not decided yet. You see that, it's it switched. <laughs> and we also use it in workshops and then the kids like to, like to find something that looks specifically like a number, but the AI identifies a different number, or the AI, AI is not sure if it's a two or a nine, but a human could identify it perfectly. So maybe I can try to find two that are pretty equal. Ah, it's hard. <laughs> it switches pretty fast. Okay, and this is not the uh, only thing of the exhibit. There's, you see the buttons below. You can also train the network. Or you can, well, you can watch the training. So there's an input, but this is not used for the training. But you can, now it's not trained. Image use, it says zero images. So if I input something, the AI does not know what it is. So you see the conf confidence bars on the right. But if I start the training, you see the, the images use the number increases. And now I stop it. 3,000 images used. Let's see if it can identify a number I write. Uh, it's not that good. It's, it's not that good uh, as it was when I showed it to you in the, the original exhibit. So I can, I can go on. And the images used are taken from an open source database called MNIST uh, where students from the U US wrote digits like many, many digits. I think it was 7, 70,000 images used to train this network. And I just said it was used, uh, uh, US students wrote the numbers. So in the US, some numbers are wrote differently than, for instance, in Germany. If I write a, a one in German, that would be a one, but it's not identified very well, at least not with this trained network of 12,000 images. If I write an American one, which is just a line, it's perfectly identified. So it depends a lot on the, the data you train it with, the training data. And what I would also like to show you, this is not part of the exhibition, but we use it in workshops, is um, these are just uh, differently trained networks. This one is trained with 300 images. And it's not very secure, not very sure what it is. And 1,500 <coughs> images. And I will share all these links with you later on so you can play for yourself. But if I would give it to you now, you would not listen to me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have the normalizer. This shows you what the AI actually sees. So it's an image made out of 28 by 28 pixels, which you can see on the right. But if I only write in one of the corners, this part of the image is moved and centered. So the image the AI sees is centered and scaled. So if I write very small, it still sees a big number. Like if I write a very small three in here, it still sees a big three. And if I write in one corner and then in the other corner, it, it suddenly gets bigger. You see that? Okay, and I should use my time a little better now. I'll show you the next exhibit I would like to show you. I am having trouble standing here. Okay. So this is on reinforcement learning. And the the it's kind of a game, but also just an interactive app. The game, uh, the aim of the game is the robot needs to find the exit of the maze which in here, it is in the upper right, but um, you can edit this maze, like you can change it, I make it a, 
the floor and put the, put the exit somewhere else. And you can train the robot by giving it candy. And so in over here, you can see my mouse, right? So if I go here, uh, it's just a very short line. You can see how the robot gets a reward. It eats the candy and it sees, oh, this is a positive reward. That's good. If there's candy, it learns it should go there. Another step, there's more candy, it's even better. It should go there. But if it continues, it steps on the lava field. And that's also a reward, but it's negative. So it gets subtracted from the total. But if, if it reaches the end of the maze, it gets a really, really high reward. But in order to learn, it needs to do this several times, like, like thousands of times it needs to reach um, the exit of the maze in order to know its way around the maze. And I'll start the training over here. And I, I can give it candy. And maybe I should have given it before. <laughs> I can, I can speed up the learning by pressing this. Ah, now it's found. Ah. And see how it learned. It, now it goes only over there. <laughs> and um, in order to find its way around the maze, there are two things the robot needs to do. It needs to explore the maze. And then it needs to exploit the information it explored already. So and down here, you see a slider. Now, it's, it's pretty far to, on the exploding, uh, exploding side. Uh, but if I move it more to explore, and the robot will go in different directions and just explore. And we have another exhibit, which is just on this topic, which is one of the core concepts of AI on exploration and exploitation. If I have time in the end, I can show you, but you will have the link afterwards and can play with it yourself. So I'm not going to show it now. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, my favorite exhibit, <laughs> uh, which is um, a treasure hunt. And uh, I connected the, the game pads you can play. You can move it around. So the, the goal is to find the treasure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now I'm standing. <laughs> The goal is to find the treasure which is hidden on the lowest part of the ocean floor. You do not know what the ocean floor looks like, but you have this boat and can move left and right, and you can send probes. If you send a probe, it will tell you on this position how deep, like it will tell you the depth of the ocean on this position, and also the slope. So what do you think, where should I go now? Left or right? Left. How far? Further. Here, I'll tr just start here. Let's see. Huh. What should I do now? Right. How far? Here? Let's see. It's not there. The treasure's not there. What should I do? Left? Too far? Left or right? Maybe we should combine it with Ricardo's exhibit so all of you could choose where to go. That would be fun, actually. Um, ah, where should I go now? What about now? Right? OK, one step back. Let's see. There it is. <laughs> and um, you see, I connected two gamepads, actually, to this computer. And we have a version for two players as well. And we can also make it full screen. So <laughs> if we will do with, without the bot first. So I don't even know which bot am I. <laughs> Okay, which one is yours? Uh, is it? Yes. Does it work? Okay, no, okay, okay. Oh, is it not there? Ah! <laughs> 
And we also have a version with um, a bot boat, which is yellow. Um, and we have actually three different bots. No bot, um, no bot is not a version. An easy bot, a medium, maybe we do the medium version? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Ah! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> That was bad luck for us. <laughs> I think we should do another round. Right? <laughs> okay, one more round. Huh. Oh. <laughs> so the, the floor changes every time, so nobody knows where the treasure is. And if you look closely at the treasure, they're also fun to read. So I just found the last digit of pi, <laughs> and they're also different treasures hidden in there. There are mathematical treasures. Okay. If you would have more time, I would ask you to play. But I, uh, I think I should tell you some more about what we, well, I wanted to show these exhibits, but I will show you where we also use them. Because the, the exhibition was developed to open in 2020, spring 2020, which you all know was the year of the pandemic. So we could not open the exhibition and we had to do something else. So we did a digital companion online with just a few of the exhibits. So the, the graphic novel is here and we have an offline on how to build your AI. And I think I saw it, a picture like that in the, from Olivier in your museum. You're doing this too, right? Yeah. It's, you, you can teach an AI how to play the game NIM. It's fun, but I'm not going to show it here, but you can explore later. And you saw the neural numbers and the gradient descent already. And in this digital companion, we also have a virtual tour, an interactive virtual tour, which is quite cool. You can check it out. And we, um, I think I should switch back to my slides. We also do workshops, uh, online workshops, which was convenient in the pandemic. We did quite a lot of them, um, about 80 so far, but the project is still going on. We are doing them together with the Goethe Institute. So we teach or we, we, we do workshops with students all over the world who learn German. So we do them in German and we just talk about AI and we explain and just and just like a workshop for, for somebody who does not speak German as a second language. But in this way, the people are engaged to, to talk and to, to learn the language in a fun way. And this is really successful. We also did teacher trainings for German teachers and for STEM teachers. And from the teacher trainings, we um, had the ideas to do, to do more of those teacher trainings. And also we collaborated with um, AI campus platform, and we developed a math open online course there, which is free. Anybody can take it. And I, yeah, I think I'm not going to show it to you to give Falter a chance to, <laughs> to also um, show some of this. Yeah, but Falter still wants to. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm jumping in for the re for the rest, little rest only of this uh, presentation. So I'm um, actually working for the physical, well, working on the physical exhibition for the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation, which has is mostly actually working on the, on, a, on a meeting. I'm not going into this, but my job is actually working in the mains in the mathematics informatics station, where we have changing exhibitions on mathematics and computer science. We only started a couple of years ago on expanding this and we have also opening hours during the year before it was only during the Idleberg Laureate Forum. And now we're actually in a very nice situation that we can show exhibitions during the year for school classes, for the general public and on request uh, for, for many kinds of groups. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to focus on the IMAI. Here you see some Nice pictures that we've taken during the pandemic, very well, with a photographer. Uh, we're not taking pictures of school classes for privacy reasons, but I mean, these also look very nice. And you get an impression what the exhibition actually looks like with the physical exhibits. 
So for the visitors, this is, a, of course, also a very different impression. Uh, if you have a physical exhibit to touch while you do this, not saying that the digital one is worse, but it's a different kind of engagement there. So I'm telling you about our experiences uh, there. It's a very broad range of visitors that we have, but I'm here now mostly focusing really on school classes because uh, that's very interesting to see kind of the response from them. <coughs> so um, the, just a few examples here. You see the station about the neural numbers here. Now, this is a touch screen where you can use it. <coughs> and uh, it's really very interesting to see. Bianca already told about uh, the, well, the impact of the data that is in there for the training. <coughs> so for the kids, it's actually very interesting to see or to tell them that despite the complexity of AI, that there is pretty simple math inside that it's composed of. It's not a magic box. <coughs> It's also very important to see, oh, sorry, one bad. Uh, it's also important to see how it fails, where you really see, because you learn more actually from failure. If AI just works, I mean, you think it's a magic box and you don't understand the, the problems of it and to make it better. And uh, all the input data kind of, that is kind of uh, important to explore and discuss. <coughs> then we have a station about to challenge AI in a very physical station, which is completely mechanical AI the Turing game table, there you're actually playing a game with these uh, magnetic uh, uh, things and you play from one side to the other. One side is trained and has a book where it actually the player can check the book, kind of what you should do. On the other side, the human player is and tries to uh, play this game against, against the AI. And you can, I mean, the human actually knows the rules, the AI is just acting by the book. And this is a very interesting, stimulating discussion with the, with the visitors, uh, actually, whether there's a difference between understanding something which the human has the rules and understands the game, but the AI actually can be very good at playing it, but has no idea of it. It doesn't even know when it wins, only the human can, can decide, well, actually, the AI won, yeah. Okay, the next one is, well, you just saw that, it's also a lot of fun here. I mean, it's a core concept. Well, it's an important concept in mathematics, gradient descent and here for training. But of course, uh, visitors, the kids and adults, they all like it a lot, just playing there. So it's not only about, you know, going into the concepts, but also a lot of fun really with the exhibition and they love it a lot. And then we also have other stations. Here is one station <coughs> about the ethics of AI. So there is one about the ethics of uh, autonomous vehicles, where the question is what actually is if an AI at some point can properly navigate through a city. It recognizes all the signs, but there are still some ethical questions left. How, what do you do in case of a conflict, you know, or some, you would crash into a car or into a person, you know, what things are there to decide, what the programmers of this self-driving car would have to decide what ethical implications this actually has. And uh, there are, it's a very nice exhibit actually where you see on that table it's projected, self-driving car is projected onto the table and with the buttons you can choose what solutions you would have. Do you prefer like saving human lives or you do you prefer reducing the insurance costs? So this is a actually, actually very stimulating thing because it really tells people, you know, these are questions that are not solved by itself or the AI decides, but we as humans actually need to do that. And really putting the questions there, what AI actually has an impact on society, and also as we as a society need to change and need to decide. And the kids should think about how do we actually want to have use AI and what are the guidelines. <clears throat> Okay, and then there is also one for the artistic thing. We actually can conduct a classical music piece on a piano and the AI actually helps you with the interpretation, with the performance of that. It's called Con Espasione. And it's also very nice actually to see how AI can do that and in some way mimic a human piano player. And because you don't need to be able to play the piano, it's being played, but you conduct it just with your hands there. Actually, it's also very, very successful exhibit 
that we already had in the Lala Lab exhibition for its musical part, and now actually this is for the AI part. Okay, so you see there is a really wide range in the exhibition that we have. <coughs> Now, just for my final slide, I mean, it's clear that AI is a very important topic, widely discussed, and I'm sometimes it's also overrated, and they say, well, you know, it, this will dominate everything in the future. Uh, it's very hard to say, but I think it's very important to be aware of the impact and to be aware that we can actually shape AI. We can also improve it. We can fix maybe some problems that it has. <clears throat> The exhibition allows from very shallow insight, you know, to very shallow look. You just play, you don't need to think about it, but you can also go very deep into the details of the exhibition. <clears throat> and the important thing here really is that the AI should not be a black box, because I mean, people are really, in my impression, they gotten used to AI, it just works. You have a, a voice assistant, it will tell you something and you don't know what actually happens behind. You're not questioning it, you think it may be right. Maybe you even talk to it like a human, like this is my Siri or Alexa. You almost think of it as a person, but it's not really intelligent, although it's called artificial intelligence. So it's very important to kind of have this education in the background, how to deal with AI. And our experience actually so far is that the visitors really like it a lot, but it's we've had not actually very hard for people to challenge the AI to question it. And it work, mostly actually works with well, guided tours or at least some introduction where you tell people, well, why does it not work, right? I mean, if the speech recognition works very nice, <clears throat> then you don't really learn much of it. But if it does not work, you can say, why does it not work? Well, it's trained on, on uh, uh, older people's voices, right? On 50-year-old people and you have a school class with 10 years, it's not recognizing it. So suddenly they can actually learn that this is important and this questioning happens. And I mean, obviously guided tours are always like the privileged version of access for a museum. So this is kind of like, of course, something for itself. But I may also just kind of put that as a question to the audience, kind of whether maybe really for that case of AI, it actually helps even more because people often find it hard to challenge the AI and just are used to some kind of magic AI where you're not looking into the black box. So thanks a lot for the attention. I think we're through. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Volker. Um, we are over time, but perhaps we can have one question and then we'll go to lunch. So do we have a question for AI, about AI for, yeah? I would like to know, uh, have you remarked difference on the perception uh, of the AI in the exhibition between eldest and youngest people visiting? In the eldest, I mean like over 30, because I still remember times where there was no software able to compute the shortest path for you <laughs> on the map. Um, I can't really tell. You know, it's... it's uh, it depends a lot actually on the question, uh, on, uh, on, on what you're looking at and also, also on the people. I mean, some older people are just, you know, using it as black box. Some are challenging itself a lot. For the kids, they're certainly more playful. They are more trying things out, but also the questioning, the understanding what's behind is also, for them, I think maybe because they got used to digital technologies and these kind of things happening, it's more normal. It's like, a, it's like a hammer that you use, it just exists, right? You're not questioning, you know, how is it built? And, uh, but this is actually in some way also true for older people because also, also many people so far did not really have enough insights into that. But I mean, this is just, you know, some impression. I've, we haven't done any, any, any evaluation of that. Yeah, that's it. the definition of technology is something that was invented after you were born. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I heard. <laughs> okay, so if you have any more questions for Sophie and Volker, just want to come down and ask them during your lunch break and maybe the other speakers who you didn't get a chance to catch, you know, try and catch them on the lunch break. You but can, can have we have a play if you come down. Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. Have a play. But can we thank all of our speakers from the morning?